right, good morning, TBC family and friends. Glad you're here. I'm really glad to be, though, in here with you. It's super cold, so welcome. Also want to say a special welcome to those engaged with us online. We know we have many that are unable to be here in person, and so they're at home engaged with us, and we just hope that your soul and your health prospers. If you've got your scriptures, let's grab those and turn together to Acts chapter 15. And if you use the YouVersion app, you're going to see additional scriptures in there you can look at later in, on your own time. But I do want to encourage everyone to get a copy of God's Word as we look at this pivotal chapter. And before we read, though, I, I want to test something on you. I, I'm going to ask a question, and I want you to make a mental vote in your head. So, here is the question. What is the most famous verse in the Bible? Now, just really quickly in your mind, come up with that verse. And here's my question. If that verse was John 3, 16, would you please let me see your hand? If you look around, I was correct. I figured this would be considered the most popular, the most famous verse in the Bible. Many of us are familiar with it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. If you grew up in church, you likely memorized that for a piece of candy or maybe a badge or a sticker. And if you didn't grow up in church, you likely saw this verse on some sign at some sporting event. So it's a very, very popular verse, but imagine with me. If John 3.16 read this way, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that who, everyone who believes in him and becomes Jewish will not perish but have eternal life. Now, if this was John 3.16, it probably would not be very famous. And if this was John 3.16, then your life as a Christian and my life would be extremely different. We would dress differently, our sermons would be differently, and our songs would especially be different. I mean, think about trying to sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a rich like me. Think about how do you sing that song if salvation, eternal life, is based on belief in Jesus and becoming Jewish? Well, this is what's at stake in Acts chapter 15. And in Acts chapter 15, there is a pivotal letter that changes everything, and I want to share it with you. Acts 15, we're going to read several verses, beginning of verse 23. The apostles and the brothers who are elders to the brothers and sisters in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, who are from the Gentiles, greetings, since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction, have confused you by their teaching of setting your souls. It's in good to us, having become of one mind, to select men and to send you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by the word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from acts of sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. And the letter ends, farewell. Now, how did we get to this pivotal letter? Why was it written? Well, you have to remember that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, they are returning and they are reporting all that God has done on their first missionary journey. They're reporting all of that in Antioch, to the church in Antioch. And so they're sharing how God opened up the door that they could share the gospel to the Gentiles. And the church in Antioch is enjoying a, a time of peace, and this is important to know in our story, that the church in Antioch is made up of both Jewish and Gentile Christians, and they're enjoying a time of peace, but they're also a giving church, a generous church. They've actually given some of, give some of their resources to the church in Jerusalem. 
So the church in Antioch is hearing all that God has done among the Gentiles. They're enjoying peace and brotherhood and sisterhood with one another. But then comes the interruption. And if you look at Acts chapter 15, verse 1, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It says, some men came down from Judea, and they came to Antioch, and began teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, get this, you cannot be saved. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the practice of circumcision in the Jewish faith, it symbolizes commitment to God, symbolizes commitment to God. Now, to modernize this, imagine someone coming into our church or someone coming into your connection group or your adult Bible studies and and teaching, unless you are baptized, you cannot be saved. This is kind of what's happening in the church in Antioch. And for us, this might sound absurd, but you've got to try to put yourself in the shoes of a first century Jewish Christian. You see, as a first century Jewish Christian, you, you remember that all the heroes of the Jewish faith were circumcised, even Jesus. And then you know in the Old Testament that you were told that if you are not circumcised, you are cut out from the family of God. And so these men felt so deeply about circumcision that it was required for salvation that they made their way to Antioch to share this news. And their message, the scripture says, led to a heated argument with Paul and Barnabas. And I love this about the early church because it's so real and so raw. So, I mean, if you've got in a heated argument with your spouse this week or with one of your children, you're in good company. I mean, it happened in the early church. It happens today. Sometimes we want to glamorize the early church, but the early church had its ups and downs, and we see this here. And it caused such a heated argument because Paul had just come back from his missionary journey. And he was just preaching Jesus. And here's actually what he preached. And I want to share it with you. In Acts 13, in verses 38 and 39, here was Paul's message to the Gentiles. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through him, speaking of Jesus, through him, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. The forgiveness of sins is through Jesus. The apostle goes on and says, and through him, Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. So this is why it led to a heated argument. Because Paul is preaching salvation is through Jesus alone. And these certain men come and say, well, it's Jesus plus circumcision. It reminds me of my dad's friend, Beverly. I hope she's not watching or listening. My dad grew up very, very poor. And and he got to where he really enjoys a good steak. And they would try to go and try different steakhouses. And they would always, a lot of times when they would go, they would take their friends, Jim and Beverly. Well, Beverly likes ketchup. So much so that even if you were to take Beverly to Three Forks, where, whatever, your favorite steakhouse, she, if you invited her, she would ask for ketchup for her steak. I would be embarrassed to be with her. And if I was the chef, I would be insulted. But this is what these men are doing to the gospel. They're trying to add something to it that is unnecessary. I appreciate what one, what one theologian says. He says this, to help the gospel, therefore, is to lose the gospel. And this is what is at stake at the church in Antioch that's made up of both Jewish and Gentile Christians. The purity of the gospel is at stake And also, the unity of the church is at stake. Imagine you are a Gentile Christian, and you are now hearing it's not just belief in Jesus, it's also being circumcised. But this is what was happening in the early church. And this tension that was being built, and there was tension if you look and you read your scriptures, this tension was so great that it required Paul and Barnabas to travel from Antioch a couple of hundred miles to Jerusalem to meet with the leaders at the Jerus- in the Jerusalem church. And that's exactly what happened. 
They traveled down to Jerusalem, and we read the story of what happened at the Jerusalem Council. And they get to the church there in Jerusalem, and the scripture says that they are welcomed by the brothers and sisters and the leaders in the church. But here's where I want to park just for a minute. I want to park at verse 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary, not it's a good idea, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to keep the law of Moses. And I want to park here just for a minute. You see it says Pharisees. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Pharisees, the Pharisees had a high regard for the law of Moses and also a strong commitment to practicing it. They were extremely religious and devout. Don't miss that. But notice it says that they were believers. They had become Christians. They become Christians, but they're still Pharisees, and so now they're trying to put these burdens on these new Christians, that to be saved, yes, it's belief in Jesus, but it's also becoming Jewish. That's what they are arguing. Belief in Jesus and becoming Jewish. This is what was at stake in the early church. This is what was in jeopardy. And I feel for these Pharisees who are Christians. I, I, I feel for them. They're like a son trying to reassure himself that he's going to be a part of the family. Now, many of us have sons and daughters in this room. And so just imagine your child one week goes above and beyond on their chores. And you're like, wow, I like that. They're, they're going above and beyond. Let's say the next week they come to you and they give you a birth certificate that they themselves have written and they want you to have it. And you think, that's odd. And then let's say the third week they start dressing and trying to imitate your every word and move. And so finally you're observing all this and you say, son, why, why are you trying to imitate me in every way? Why did you feel the need to write up your own birth certificate? And why are you going always above and beyond your chores? And your son says, I just want to reassure myself that I'm still a part of your family. See, once you are born into the family as a son or daughter, you are in the family. You did nothing to get into the family, and you can do nothing to get out of the family. And it's the same thing for the Christian faith. Once you are in God's family, you are in God's family. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. You are in. And I feel for these Pharisees who are Christians because they don't feel this. They have this belief in Jesus, but they believe equal to that is their behavior. And that's what they're banking on. And I want to park here because I think this is where some of us in this room is where we are parked spiritually. Spiritually. We believe in Jesus, but we're also banking on believing in something else. Maybe it's belief in Jesus plus baptism. Maybe it's belief in Jesus and a list of these religious activities that you're telling yourself you have to do. Maybe it's belief in, G in Jesus plus dressing a certain way. Maybe it's belief in Jesus plus moral behavior. And so I want to park here because I think many of us are spiritually parked here. And I want to remind you that if you are saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, then that keeps you. Once you're born into the family of God, you can't get out of the family of God. And so I feel for these Pharisees. I feel for the tension and for the struggle that they are facing. And I feel that way for you. If this reflects your life, your story, that it's hard for you to imagine that once you believe you're in, so therefore you're adding all these other requirements, hoping to earn God's love and affection and salvation for you. Now it says, the story goes on, it says this led to much debate. 
Again, I love that. They're debating. They're, they're Christians, and they're debating all this. And finally, Peter stands up, and Peter gives his testimony, his experience of how he saw God save Gentiles. And so Peter stands up, he shares his experience, and he says this in verse 11 of chapter 15. We believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in the same way as they also are. And so then Peter sits down, and then Paul and Barnabas get up, and they begin to tell and, how, and tell and share their experience of how God saved the Gentiles. And then they sit down, and then the leader of the church in Jerusalem, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he stands up. And I think it's brilliant what he does. He says, Peter is right. Paul and Barnabas are right. Because this is what the Bible says. And James quotes a passage from the Old Testament that says that from the beginning, God has been calling the Gentiles to himself. And because of this, there is a decision that is made. And that decision is in verse 19. James says, therefore, it is my judgment that we do not cause trouble for those from the Gentiles who are turning to God. Decision made. And this was such a pivotal, monumental decision. I can't stress that enough that they put it in writing and they just didn't take the letter. They took the letter, they, they wrote the letter, they gave it to four faithful men that included Barnabas and Paul. And they sent these men as witnesses with this letter to these churches to deliver this good saving news that it's Jesus alone that brings salvation to them. And so they were sent. So this was a pivotal, phenomenal moment for the church. And as we close, I just want to look at a couple of things in this letter, the letter that we read, because I believe it addresses two groups of people and two issues that we saw in the story. But in this letter, it says, for it seemed good in verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden. And so the leaders of the church all together believed this. They all came together and unanimously agreed this. And so the message to the Jewish Christians was don't burden our Gentile brothers and sisters with these requirements. Keep the gospel pure. Keep the gospel pure. Don't add anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then there's something else after that. That's, that's first and foremost. Keep the gospel pure. You don't have to become Jewish to be a Christian. But then the letter says this. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. And he's going to give them these essentials. That you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from acts of sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. Here, I believe that the letter is speaking to the Gentile Christians and saying, hey, listen, in order to have fellowship with our Jewish brothers and sisters who are Christians, let's be mindful and considerate to some of the things that they still want to observe. And so let's be considerate of one another. And so I believe this letter tackles both the purity of the gospel and the unity of the church. The apostle Paul would go on later in one of his letters and say this, he says, if eating meat sacrificed to idols causes one of my brothers or sisters to stumble, then I won't eat meat. He's being considerate. And that's what this letter is calling the church to do. Salvation is through Christ alone, period. But as Jewish and Gentile Christians, as we fellowship together, let us be considerate of one another. And you know what happened when this letter was read? It says this, verse 31. When they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. They rejoiced because of its encouragement. If someone you admired was going to take you to dinner, maybe it's a professional athlete that you admire, maybe it's a certain business leader that you look up to, maybe it's just a really good friend, and they were to send you a message, hey, I, I want to I wanna meet you for lunch. What would fill your heart? I would imagine if it was someone you admired, 
the joy and encouragement would fill your heart. Well, when this message was delivered to the church, it was made up of both Gentiles and Jewish Christians. It filled their heart with joy and encouragement. And so my question for all of us this morning, whether you're in the room or outside the room, when you hear that salvation is through Christ alone, what fills your heart? Is it joy and encouragement because it's not up to you and your good works? Then amen. But if you hear this message, that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone, and your heart is indifferent, then I want to encourage you, that may be because you've not believed in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would help you soften your heart towards that message. But maybe you are a Christian and you're sitting here and you hear that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone, but you feel indifferent. My question for you is, is it because you're hoping in some way you feel that it's based on your good works, that it's Jesus plus your good behavior that's what's going to save you? If that's you, I want to encourage you to spend time, even in this moment, to ask the Holy Spirit of God to help you rest assured that as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are in his family, period. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together as we sing one final song. Father, we want to thank you again for our time together around your word, your very word to us. And we just want to pray that as Christians, that we would rest assured that because of the work of Jesus Christ, man, our faith in him, that we are saved wholly, fully, forever, and completely. And we say thank you. Father, for the one among us who's far from you, who when they hear of your grace through Jesus Christ and they have no affection or no, no joy rises in their heart, we pray that you would draw them to yourself. And Father, for the, the Christian who is acting like the Pharisees, that they have their belief in you, but they also have their rules or their regulations, I pray your spirit would gently come alongside them and convict them and move in their hearts this morning. And so God, we thank you for our time together. May you open up our heart to receive your word. We pray this in Jesus' great name, amen.